Well, hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined again today by my co-host, Pastor Isaac Crockett. If I were to ask you what you believe to be the most serious issue facing America, what would you say? Well, today we're going to examine what many people would say, and what I believe God is saying is the most critical cultural issue and concern facing our nation today. Our theme is a silent church, a corrupted culture. This issue of a corrupted culture is the one that most greatly jeopardizes our freedom and guarantees God's judgment, not His blessing, on our nation. What should be alarming to everyone is that our American culture is now marked more by moral corruption than moral virtue. And this observation is not limited to a particular age, category, or one political persuasion. Yet as irrefutable as the condition is, the unasked question is why and how we've reached this point in our nation. For those of us in the silent or boomer generations, we know in our hearts that this is true. We see all around us that the America of 2018 is not the America of a generation ago, and we're concerned. While the millennial generation has had less life experience to compare against, they're no less concerned. For the upcoming generation Z and beyond, they've never seen the America we remember and are driven not by defined moral standards and concepts of virtue, but a cultural repudiation of defined morals and standards. And because we're devolving so very quickly, we must ask ourselves the very real question. If something doesn't happen very soon to change our path, can our national freedoms and blessings we've come to enjoy survive? So the question is, does our current condition have an identifiable cause? Does it have a solution? Well, the answer is yes, but only if we honestly examine from God's perspective this transcending issue and all challenges facing our nation. And we're going to do that on today's program. Here, Isaac and I examine all issues from God's perspective. We call this uh, looking at life through the lens of a biblical worldview because only when we start with God and God as Creator can we understand the reality and the impact of sin and fall and the nature of man and his relationship to God as Creator, and then move to the position of hope through redemption in Jesus Christ. We'll follow the same simple approach of problem, cause, solution, and use the Bible and the principles of God's authoritative Word as our guide. So today on this program and the next one, we're honored to have as our special guest the one social scientist and researcher who's been analyzing and researching culture and morality longer, and I'm going to say likely more in depth than any living person, Dr. George Barna, formerly with the Barna Research Group, author, speaker, and friend of all of those who love freedom and fear God. In just a few moments, we're going to bring George into the program as we examine this theme for today's show, A Silent Church a corrupted culture. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution, educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. Now, before we bring in our special guest, uh, Dr. George Barn, I'd like to go to you, Isaac, right now. Let's just have just a very brief <laughs> analysis. We're talking about change in culture. Our theme, silent church, corrupted culture. You're a millennial. I'm obviously a boomer type, um, but i just like to know from your perspective and your growing up and your 30-some years of living, when you look back, how have you seen moral change or 
cultural change that stands out most to you? How would you kind of sum it up? I would, you know, just from working in the classroom and working with kids at our church, I just look at our entertainment as America and in the church. And, you know, um, the, the songs out there, you know, the seven deadly sins are now not deadly sins to be avoided. Those are the things we want, the lust and envy and gluttony and all those video games that used to be little Pac-Man chasing ghosts are now, you know, people shooting and killing, um, you know, the, the programming on TV is just horrible, the violence and the nudity on it. And so I just say, even just in our entertainment choices, what I see even church people and Christian people, you know, doing uh, has just, it just blows my mind. I just can't, can't believe it sometimes. But, but let's go to your generation now. As a boomer, somebody who lived through the 60s and remembers it, uh, what, what changes do you see looking back even further than what I can obviously look back? Well, it's interesting that you noticed and mentioned entertainment because your generation has been far more impacted by media and communications mm -hmm. than, than mine. But I'll tell you, Isaac, the thing that I recall and I look back at, I would say would be marked by this. When I was growing up, there were far more boundaries, hmm. uh, fences I would put them. Uh, there were identified standards. There were things that were right and wrong. There were, there were measurable aspects of integrity and character that were things to be honored and respected by those in office, as an example, and, and so forth. And those seemed to be totally removed. And I'm going to go a step further and say, not only have the fences removed, I think we've almost developed an attitude that says that if you do want to put up a fence, Mm. If you do want to establish a standard as a parent or as a grandparent or anyone else, you're almost ridiculed by this society and this culture as saying how out of step with reality you are. There's been a complete reversal. That's what I would say, Isaac. And I think that's a great setup for bringing in our guest here right now. I want to welcome right now to the program George Varna. Thank you for, for being with us today, George. It's a real pleasure to have you on the program. Well, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. Well, George, just a little bit. People, most people know your name, but just, just take 30 seconds or whatever you could put in there. How long have you been doing research as a social scientist and looking at cultural issues? Just, just a little bit about how long God has permitted you to be a part of helping the American people to understand the real changes that are impacting us perhaps greater than anything. It's been quite a progression back in the uh, mid-70s is when I started, it was in political work at that point, working for candidates, state government. So I was doing primarily local and statewide surveys at that point, and then had the opportunity to branch out beyond politics to do marketing research and, and eventually cultural research. And that has been more national in scope. So I've been at this for more than, than 40 years. And I've had the opportunity to look at all different segments of our population, different age groups, different ethnic groups, uh, all, all kinds of uh, spiritual and religious segments of the population. So it's been a real education, and it's been interesting to watch the progression. Nobody 40 years ago would really have thought that we would be where America's at today in terms of the shifts that we've seen mm. take place. That's, that's my sense as well, George, and I, I know because of that, that's why I want you to have, have be on the program because you have been doing it for a long time. Let me just go here real quickly as we try to go into this. Um, when I did research preparation for this, I found it somewhat interesting that as I looked at those who measure changes, most important changes in our culture, uh, I found one from 2004, and it's going to be on the screen in just a moment, but the, but the top 10 items were the computer, globalization, communications, the financial revolution, management and labor, productivity, women, the imperial and the imperially compensated CEO, antitrust, and the internet as the things that marked most change in our culture. But as I looked at other things as well, George, I didn't find any of them that mentioned the changes in morality. Why is it that from a social science perspective, those measuring our economy look at these other things, which are clearly true, but overlook perhaps the most important one, that's changes in morality. Yes, yeah, Sam, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Americans tend not to think of morality as an issue. It's just something that exists, it's how they live, and they don't spend a lot of time focusing on it. Americans are not very self-reflective. 
And so what happens is we we kind of accept our morals as, as part of who we are and we do the best as we go along. It's interesting, we have this expression in our culture, you can't legislate morality, when in point of fact, the exact opposite is true. All that legislation is, mm -hmm. is the codification of what we accept as reasonable morality. So what we tend to do is, is we address symptoms rather than causes. Morality actually represents the cause of so many of the problems and the obstacles, the barriers, the challenges that we face in, in our culture. And yet we tend not to dig deep enough to get to those things. We are more comfortable at a superficial level. So for that reason, we don't tend to think of morality when people say, well, what are the big issues facing us? They'll talk about the economy, they'll talk about technology, healthcare, immigration, etc. But they won't go back and say, but why are those issues? Is it because of what we believe to be right and wrong, what we believe to be true or false, how it is that we define truth, where we find truth? Those are the real key issues, but we don't go there. I'm, I'm glad you went there because we talk a lot about symptoms and cause and, and, and problems here as well, George. And uh, understanding that, that the morality affects all of the policies and all that happens on all of those issues, you, you, you made that point. I'm glad you made that. Now, last year, 2017, uh, Gallup re uh, replay, replaced a survey on American attitudes toward morality. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they said that 77% say morality is getting worse. 81% says it's, getting, it's currently fair or poor. But... I want to add to that, that this last summer, April 24, you did a survey and you issued it a report. The title was, Americans Redefine Family Morality, and you wrote this, quote, it turns out that Barack Obama was not the only one who wanted to fundamentally transform American society. A new survey by the American Culture and Faith Institute, which you were the executive director, shows that a large majority of the nation's adults have radically redefined moral behavior related to family matters and that it appears they are not finished making such changes. My question to you, George, is this. Did you find that moral standards are changing only in matters of human sexuality or across the board of moral values? Do we even have a consistent definition of morality? Yeah, in America, we've redefined morality to be whatever makes me feel good and whatever I think feels like it's right. And so what we do see and what we have seen for quite a while now is that there's a consistent shifting of our moral standards. If we go back 40 years ago when I started all this and compare what we found then to what we find today, there's a radical difference, not just in terms of sexuality, but in terms of marriage and pornography and relationships and uh, substance use, uh, life itself. All of these things are radically changing. Uh, we see those changes across all generations. Now, the biggest changes are within the what's often called Gen X generation and the millennial generation. And a large part of that is that they don't have biblical foundations as part of their background that they can turn to as one input for morality. So what my research has been showing is that most Americans now, including born-again Christians, say that the way that you determine moral truth, moral righteousness, is based on how you feel. In fact, we found that even six out of seven born-again Christians, not people who call themselves that, but people who, based on their beliefs, uh, would, would be classified as born again, believing that it's up to Christ what happens to their, their future, that they've confessed their sins and accepted him as their savior. That particular group, six out of seven of them say that mm. morality is based on feelings. So we've lost touch with God's word, the, the ultimate source of truth, as our source of moral understanding and foundations. And consequently, what's happened is that morality now, rather than being defined by God, is being defined by humanity. And when we define it, it goes back to feelings, and those feelings are impacted by our culture, predominantly by media. 
So let's uh, go now, George, to those feelings. You've talked, uh, you've used the terminology of foundations. People in my generation and in my age uh, don't have the same foundations. You've talked about shifting. You said our culture, our morals have shifted. They're shifting. Uh, but in using those terms, let's talk about the pillars then uh, that, that go from the foundation of the Word of God and the pillars that keep our culture and our morality afloat. Uh, here at the American Pastors Network, we talk a lot about the biblical worldview. You talk a lot about biblical worldview. And we talk about there being four pillars. Uh, every person is an individual. There's an individual responsibility. Then there's the family structure, the pillar of the family. And then there's a third pillar of civil authority. Sometimes we could, you know, look at government. And then there's the, the last one is church and the pillar of the church. And so as we, as we look through those and we talk about shifting, especially in the younger generations, it's been shifting those pillars. And how, how, do, how important are those pillars in our culture right now? What kind of changes have happened um, in, you know, in those pillars of our culture? Yeah, those pillars are, are uh, of course, critical. When, w when we look at the four of them, they're integrated. Each impacts the other in very dramatic ways. You ha we have to understand that as individuals, we're like clay, and we're being molded all the time. We're being molded by family. We're being molded by the church. We're being molded by the government. How does that work? You know, families really are the ones who are responsible to provide us with the basic tools that we need to become who we're going to be. We know that people embrace mor morals and core beliefs for the duration of their life by the time they're age 13. So family plays an absolutely crucial role in introducing us to the right ways of making decisions, of viewing the world, uh, how to think appropriately about these kinds of issues. The church is critical because it needs to be instructing parents and assisting parents and families in the development of children and even adults as they're trying to implement those perspectives in their lives. It's the truth, truth of God's word that the church has the opportunity to describe to us and to help us integrate in, into how we live. It's the church that puts us into a community where there can be accountability and, and the Word of God from which we get our sense of hope as well as direction. Government, of course, is important because it's the one that gives us the freedom and protects us in the midst of exercising that religious freedom to understand these things and to begin to implement them in our lives. So all of those have to work together to make us who we become. Wow, that, that is so important, and I think it's key for our, our, our viewing audience to see that. And you've been on our radio program, and you're on with us today, and the, the name of our program is Stand in the Gap. And so I want you to be as direct with us as possible. What are we talking about, this gap in our culture? Um, how much trouble do you think we are in as a nation? And do you think um, that uh, with this lack of worldview going on in our nation, this uh, seems like our freedoms are... are close to follow, that they may be fleeting, uh, our lack of holiness within the church, our lack of moral instruction from parents. Um, is, do you see that, that our whole Christian nation, our moral foundation, that it's breaking? And if so, can it be, is, do you think it's possible? We only have a couple minutes here for me to ask this question, but do you think it's possible for it to be repaired? I think it's possible to be repaired. You always have to have hope. Uh, God is in control. We're not. But the reality is, as we analyze American society today, my conclusion is that we're rapidly moving toward, and we're probably in the early stages of, moral and spiritual anarchy. Uh, a situation where essentially we want control of everything. We don't want to give God control. I mean, he has it, but but we're not willing to accept that. So our values have shifted dramatically where control and comfort and convenience and happiness, those are the things that are more important to us than the things that God says are important, which are things like truth and, and love and service and uh, wisdom and humility. So we've really seen that our values have taken us down a completely different path than we would say God had initiated for us. The, the consequence, I would say, is unfettered selfishness mm. in America today, and that's, mm. that, that's a major issue. So if we can understand that freedom requires self-control, it requires sacrifice, it requires us to, to embrace commitment and responsibility, and to look to that ultimate source of truth, which we find in God's Word, we can get back on track. If we're not willing to do that, it's going to be a long haul. 
Wow, George, thank you. Let's, let's go there on our next segment. We got to take a little break right now, but let's talk about that, getting back to the Word of God, finding freedom through self-control and sacrifice in the Word of God. And so when we come back after this short break, we're going to be talking and discussing uh, God's role for believers, for Christians. It's interesting that Jesus, when he was on earth, he called his believers, they weren't just converts, they were disciples. So there was expectations for them to follow and to grow and uh, we want to talk about that in just a few moments when we come back from this short break. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. Our special guest today, Dr. George Barna. Our theme, Silent Church, a Corrupted Culture. Uh, George, just in the last couple of minutes here, I'd like you to build out further on what we were just talking about. The institutions of individual, home, church, civil authority are God's design for any society to be blessed of God. They have to work together. You were defining that a little bit. I'd like you to bear down, if you could, though, on the order, how it should work from God's perspective. Who has the lead responsibility? The church? The individual? Put, kind of put those together as what the design really ought to be from God's perspective. Yeah, I think what we're looking at here is that if parents are going to be blessed with a child, it's their responsibility to raise that individual to know, love, serve, worship, and obey God. That's really their primary responsibility in life but they can't do it alone. That's the idea of the church, a community of believers who come around every family to encourage them, to support them, to help them to do that job of raising godly individuals. So it really needs to be a partnership between the family and the church. The government is there not to get in the way and not to tell us how to do it, but just to make sure that we have the opportunity to do that. And so that really is the key, is that family and the community of believers, which we call the church, work together to make sure that children have a biblical worldview, recognize that their job in life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who imitates, lives like Christ. And if we do that, then we've done what we were called to do. Uh, George, you've talked a lot about discipleship making and the, role of the, and the role of the church in that regard. And Isaac referred to that right now. The church is also referred to as salt and light in the scripture. From your measurements, from your research, have you, are you able to demonstrate that the salt is not really salty and the light is not real light and, and therefore put some burden back on the church here? Has the church been silent, George, as uh, our title suggests? Yeah, I mean, we, we have an abundance of research, and this has been one of the primary focuses of my research for years. Uh, the, the church, as we think of it and as we know it, has not been active enough in helping people to stay on track. We have an errant set of measures of success for churches where we look at bigness and wealth and uh, opportunities and whatnot as opposed to faithfulness, as opposed to holiness, as opposed to truth and integrity. And, and so when people are looking around the culture to take their cues as to what's right, what's meaningful, the church is not one of the players that they're taking seriously because the church is focused on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they're getting their cues from entertainment. They're getting their cues from other institutions. So yeah, this is a, a period in American history where the church is not playing that role uh, of helping us stay the course of righteousness. And, and if the church doesn't play that role, the chances are that our entire culture is going to suffer. Because who is going to play that role? And now we're Nobody going to else has the truth. And we're going to stop right there, George. We're out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is part one. I want you to stay with us for next week. We're going to have on part two. George will be with us again because today we've established the problem. We've gone to the church.
Shepherd. In the next program, we're going to talk about the cause. The cause. We're going to talk about the silent church. Why a silent church? And then we're going to talk about solution. A serious problem facing America. And every one of you who know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, you are a part of the solution. You also could be part of the problem. I hope that you are a part of the solution. So, stay with us. Come back and join us next week for part two. And let us hear from you. Write to us. Let us know that you enjoy watching Stand in the Gap. <laughs>